<laughs> Thank you for that introduction, Kathy. It's a little sobering to hear it all lined up like that. <laughs> all right, yes. We are very pleased to be here and share our crazy friendship with you. Looking forward to it all year. Uh, my fiber career started late, in my opinion. Um, in 2003, I was given 15 pounds of llama wool. Now, the woman was using it as mulch, and I told her, I'm pretty sure you can make yarn out of that. Um, I crochet afghans every winter, and it was getting expensive. So I bought a wheel and taught myself how to spin and process wool. I still spin, I no longer process. Um, but where they sell spinning supplies, they also sell weaving supplies. And yes, you can see the rabbit hole coming, right? <laughs> Just like I was going to spin wool yarn cheaper than I could buy it. <laughs> those, those are the spinners. <laughs> um, I was going to weave all of my towels, my drapes, my bed clothes, <laughs> as Weaver does, right? <laughs> but this is Dean, my husband. He said, no. <laughs> you collect hobbies as a hobby and you just bought this spinning wheel. I'm fairly certain you won't be using this in six months. And all of that was probably true. But I showed him, I found a weaving technique that was really cheap to get into, 25 bucks. And once I proved that this wasn't just a hobby, um, I could get a big floor loom and finally become a real weaver. Of course, I did end up buying looms for card weaving and more looms. I did finally get a floor loom. Of course, his prediction about the floor loom was true. I hardly ever used it because I couldn't stop tablet weaving. My first memories of weaving are visiting Greenfield Village in Michigan in the 1970s with my parents and grandparents. I started very early. I was so captivated by the looms in the weaving shop that my parents moved on and they left me staying there for a while. I remember the colonial housewife weaving on the big barn loom, and the seed was planted. But I have to say, I wasn't totally sold on the antique hand wovens that I saw there. <laughs> Fast forward to 1986. After I graduated from college and moved to St. Louis, I took a weaving class at a local shop, learning on a cranky old Dorothy table loom. I was hooked and I bought the Harrisville four shaft loom in the store window. I drove it home to my studio apartment. It was strapped <laughs> to the roof of my Honda Accord. <laughs> I started off teaching myself from learning to weave with Debbie Redding and Halcyon's Yarn Store in a Box. But it was when I discovered workshops and conferences that my weaving really took off. My first weave Midwest Weavers Conference was 1983 in Cedar Falls, Iowa. It was, I was only there for one day. I took a half-day uh, seminar with Anita Mayer and a half-day seminar with Heather Winslow. That's all it took. I was a conference junkie. Shortly after that, I took a week-long weaving and critique workshop with Randall Darwell at the University of Minnesota Split Rock Arts Program. I cringe now to think of how little I knew. He was very patient with me. It was at that workshop, though, that I learned one of the most valuable lessons ever. I'll never forget Randy telling me that the secret is to just keep doing it. To become a better warper, warp the loom often. Short warps and warp a lot. To become a better weaver, keep weaving. Learn from those mistakes and weave some more. Since then, I've attended almost every Midwest, Convergence, and Complex Weavers, as well as countless workshops. Even now, with all that workshop experience, I still always learn something from the teacher and often usually from the other students as well. Anyway, pretty soon I was going to town. I started with Turn 12 Block, something I fell in love with at Randy Darwell's workshop. In fact, Turn 12 gave me my first case of shaft envy. <laughs> I bought my 8-shaft loom in 1994, just a year after taking that workshop with Randy. And I wove a vest for my mother in Theo Mormon technique, thanks to the workshop I took with Heather Winslow in the 1993 Midwest Weavers Conference. 
and placemats in plain weave and placemats in a rep weave var variation from handwoven and a whole series of pillows for my family. This is the one that matched my parents' living room. I also wove a pair of throws personalized for the nieces of a friend of mine. These are in summer and winter. And it was my first experience with profile drafting and block weaves. Now that I think about it, it was actually the first time I spent hours and hours virtually weaving on the computer before I ever sat down at the loom to, to warp it. And that is a premonition for things to come. And in addition to weaving, I started volunteering. First for my local guild, and then for the original weaving list, which then morphed into 20 years of weave tech, complex weavers, and Midwest weavers. I, on the other hand, was self-taught with almost everything. Um, here's just a small sampling of some of my past hobbies. So, <laughs> poker. I really believed I was going to be a professional poker player. Um, <laughs> um, actually, I was pretty good at it. Um, I thought I'd take up writing and become a fam famous science fiction author. Um, instead, that's become my husband. But, um, magic. I had been fascinated with it since grade school. I was going to be the next David Copperfield. Um, and I've actually threatened to do card tricks in my tablet weaving classes. <laughs> but uh, honestly, all of these books are still on my library shelves at home. I taught myself how to do macrame in high school. And my mom, until very recently, still had these on the wall <laughs> from high school. I taught myself how to crochet from pattern books, um, Afghans in the winter and doilies in the summer. After I got my Ashford Traveler, I taught myself how to spin using these fine books. And then I taught myself how to tablet weave using these books. And I honestly had no idea there were such things as weaving conferences or guild workshops until after I had been in the St. Louis Guild for probably over a year. So being a collector of many hobbies, I once asked you, Amy, how much time do you spend weaving? I was confused. I mean, do you mean sitting at the loom throwing the shuttle, or warping and weaving, or thinking about weaving? Well, a hobby is something you do on the weekends, or maybe occasionally in the evenings when you get some time. No. I think about weaving all the time, and I weave whenever I can get a few minutes away. And that was a game changer for me, that weaving could be not a hobby, but a lifestyle. So now, I'm a band weaver, proudly a band weaver and a tablet weaver specifically, and I teach it, and I write about it, and make DVDs about it. And there are lots of other fiber things I've tried, like dyeing, felting, felting, <laughs> no done, <laughs> and sewing. <laughs> but this is what I do. I'm a band weaver. I wish it was that easy to define myself. I know some of you have heard Madeline Vanderhood's assertion that there are two kinds of weavers, color weavers and structure weavers. I was fortunate enough to have Sharon Alderman as one of my early weaving mentors, and I've adopted her idea of striving for a marriage of color and structure. I love nothing more than deep diving into structure with some of my heroes, people like Ingrid Bozell, Alice Schlein, Bonnie Inouye, Margaret Coe, Marion Stubanitsky, and others. And my favorite color? All of them. <laughs> it only takes looking at our respective equipment to see that we're totally different weavers. I still have the Harrisville foreshaft that I purchased in 1986. I've woven more than a thousand dish towels on it already and it's still going strong. The H-shaft home loom I have is my workhorse for baby blankets, shawls, and scarves. The 16-shaft CompuDobby one I bought in the late 1990s is 60 inches wide and perfect for blankets. So you do weave bedclothes on your loom. <laughs> this is my newest toy, a 40-shaft ABL CompuDobby three. I bought it from Mark Coe in Tucson, Arizona, and John and I had a fabulous road trip driving it back in a rented minivan. <laughs> By the late 1990s, I already had a loom in the living room, a loom in the dining room, a loom in the unfinished basement. My partner, Mary Jo, finally called Uncle, and we built a loom, a studio in the basement that fits all of my looms. So, tablet weaver, 
multi-shaft floor loom weaver. How did we become such good friends? I don't know, because this is what I call loom. <laughs> and that's what I call a studio. <laughs> we could not be two more different people. <laughs> John first skulked into my life when he joined our local guild. It was winter, and at the time we met in an old barn on an old property in North St. Louis County. It was dark outside in the evenings and dark inside the barn, and this tall guy with a long coat and a weird hat started coming to the meetings. I ran a lot of the meetings in those days, and I tried to talk to him both at the meeting and after when we were cleaning up. And after every meeting, I'd go home and tell Mary Jo, he won't talk to me. It was so frustrating. Amy was this very intimidating presence. Um, she always came to the meetings directly from her day job at the bank, wearing her full bank attire. And obviously she knew more than anyone else at that night uh, meeting that we went to. So there was no way I was going to approach her. So I crocheted my doilies at the meeting. I found you had to have something in your hands. I hadn't taught myself to knit yet. Um, I scooted off directly after the, the meeting. I thought I had little in common with these people. I mean, most of the people in the guild had 30 plus years on me, were female, with grandchildren, uh, except Amy, but she scared me. <laughs> interactions at Guild were a little bit rough, given my outspoken nature. Really? Let's see. <laughs> so, I love telling the Amy story in class, and um, even I, the, I apologize. I know he tells a lot of Amy stories in class. <laughs> I'm so sorry. The people at my workshop this past week can attest to that. Um, well, and it's probably because you taught me so much, but I had just taken this band off the loom. It was the second band ever, I think. And I brought it to the guild for show and tell. And it reached Amy, and she stopped and looked at me and said, is it finished? And I said, yes. <laughs> and in my head, I was like, it's off the loom, duh. <laughs> she was kind enough not to point out that what she meant was that was it wet finished and not to call me out as a fiber idiot. <laughs> I simply nodded and passed it on, I'm sure. Shout out to another one of my very favorite weaving teachers, Laura Fry, who says it's not finished till it's wet finished. So another favorite class story is about this band, my yoga strap, which I was very proud of. Um, we knew each other a little better at this point, and I was looking for, you know, a good quick pat on the head. Good job, John. <laughs> but instead I got... You know, it looks kind of flat. Oh, <laughs> I was devastated. I was kind of hard on John at the beginning, but I think there's a lot of value in constructive criticism, and I could already see its potential. <laughs> That's my excuse anyway. <laughs> well, and to her credit, she explained why. I mean, it's only two colors, and they're two very similar colors. So, um, and your advice was? This is another piece of advice I learned from Sharon Alderman. When you're making a solid cloth and you want to make it a little more interesting, use two different but closely related hues instead of just one. And so, now my bands have much more visual interest. Um, this one used a variegated and a solid as the blue. And um, the variegated was from Just Our Yarns and it was a much richer band for it. Thank you very much, Amy. So those are Rocky Guild interactions, and I'm sure it could have ended there, but we have Midwest to thank for being the ultimate matchmaker. Midwest 2005 in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, came right on the heels of the St. Louis group doing, hosting two back-to-back -back conferences, 2001 and 2003. So when we got to Sheboygan, we were all in the mood to have a very good time. Craig and Carolyn Hart, Mary Jo and I immediately com connected with Sarah Lamb, Deb Menz, and Heather Winslow. We were a noisy crowd, to say the least. <laughs> At the first meal, I looked up, and there was John, sneaking into the back of the dining hall with a book under his arm. So, books... 
Books are great social shields. <laughs> I'm an introvert, and in high school and college, I found that books were a great way to discour discourage casual conversation. Um, however, this doesn't work at weaving venues. <laughs> I found that out on more than one occasion. Um, so this is how you would have found me at most meals at the Sheboygan Conference. Uh, it was my first ever weaving conference, and by the way, I don't look much different here because these next slides are actually a reenactment. <laughs> So these are guild members at the same conference enjoying their meal. Uh, again, some actors were used to portray this reality. <laughs> that is Amy and Mary Jo, but... So Amy had sworn... <laughs> that wasn't far from the truth. <laughs> Amy had sworn that she would break my introverted shell. Um, she'd been trying to approach me at guild meetings and I wouldn't have it, but she was going to get to know me, period, the end. At one of the infamous cafeteria dinners, I got up, walked across the room, grabbed him by the arm, and forced him to sit at the rowdy table with us. <laughs> and I will say, I am very happy she did. Um, that first conference was an incredible experience, made more so by my inclusion into the gang. <laughs> And all of these people have greatly influenced my weaving then and now. Um, you can find it years later that that was my last chance. Truly, it was. And that if I continued to be my hermit self, you were going to give up. And I will tell you, my life would be very different right now if I had continued to be uh, weaving in solitude. But it is a wonder, given such a rocky start, that we actually did become friends. And by the way, at these conferences, did you know they have fashion shows? Because I didn't, and I'm a guy and I didn't really think I cared, but they dragged me to that fashion show. Literally dragged him once again. And then look at him, 14 years later, strutting his stuff in Indianapolis. I was so proud. <laughs> We had a lot of misconceptions about each other at the beginning. One time, in a desperate attempt to break the ice, I bought John a gift. A loaf of seedy, whole grain bread. After all, I was sure he was a health nut. <laughs> Later, when we met on our first road trip together, he showed up with this for breakfast. <laughs> on him enough now that at least we have the same vice, Starbucks. <laughs> there is one TV in my house. It is on way too much, but there is one and only one TV in my house. Now, I had heard how productive Amy was. I knew she had a full-time job, and yet uh, she was at her loom all the time. And she had told me a few stories of her childhood that included sprouts on sandwiches and things. So I was pretty sure she came from one of those families where TVs were not part of your childhood. I visited her house, and literally there was a TV in every room, <laughs> even in the kitchen. Seeing John's donuts, I have to confess my love for trashy TV. Real housewives, anyone? Thank goodness I can listen to TV while I'm weaving. And I'm a big fan of audiobooks for the same reason, although sometimes an errant shuttle or thread causes me to miss a plot point or two. I listened to Cold Mountain when I was in a book club and couldn't understand why everybody else thought it was such a depressing book, because somehow I missed that all the main characters died at the end. <laughs> So clearly we are very different people. I mean, she's a Virgo. He's a Taurus. She's a woman. He is such a guy. He is such a guy that everything is a competition. Of, of course, weaving is competitive. That's why I'm always checking on your progress in workshops to see if I'm winning. And I just roll my eyes and say, of course you're winning, John, because I know I'm really the one that's always going to win. In spite of these rocky starts and differences, we also discovered, not, not too long into our friendship, that we had actually a lot in common. Uh, it seems both of us value accurate and consistent terminology around our respective weaving processes. 
Take weaving drafts, for instance. Weaving drafts, nomenclature in the shaft loom weaving world is complicated, and in the multi-shaft loom world, it's even more complicated. Like discussing color, there's fancy evocative names like crackle, and there are practical descriptive names. For example, in color, you might call the color of the sunrise mauve, but you could also call it a pale tint of desaturated red violet. Now, that's going to be lousy in a poem, but it's much more helpful if you're trying to re replicate it in dyes. I'm currently obsessed with the term echo. Marian Stupanitsky wrote a very inspiring book called Echo and Iris, and as a result, it seems like everybody wants to be weaving echo, except echo's not a weave structure. It's a poetic reference to the way her parallel threadings are derived with one, two, or three echoes of a main design line. So I hear people call this fabric Echo Twill. Actually, it's a parallel four threading woven with a twill tie. I know, not so romantic, but it's descriptive. And if you look at the thread interlacement, it's nothing like a twill at all. So I will always call this as parallel threading woven as twill. I, too, have a drafty problem. Um, this is the draft from the book I learned tablet weaving from called Card Weaving by Candace Crockett. This was from a different book written about the same time, also called originally Card Weaving, but by Ruth Katz. And even if you don't card weave, I hope you see some significant differences. <laughs> we have left and right arrows versus up and down arrows. We have numbers going left to right. We have numbers going right to left. This is my drafting notation. I got it from Bioways and Hand Weaving by Mary Meigs Atwater. Um, I sprinkled in a little Peter Collingwood for the S and Z notation on the bottom. And I have just one more example. My good friend Claudia Volney in Germany just wrote an excellent book called Tablets at Work. It's full of lots of techniques, lots of patterns, um, lots of theory, but wait, now we have numbers running up the side instead of letters. We have arrows and S's and Z's. It was driving me batty. Now I was twist for many years, and that is Tablet Weavers International Studies and Technique. It's actually an acronym, isn't that silly? <laughs> it's a tablet weaving journal, and um, I tried for years to get them to standardize on some drafting notation but to no avail. Something else John and I have in common is that we both like to push the limits. For me, it's taking the challenge of what's published on eight and four shafts and incorporating more shafts. This fabric is basically shaded twills. I started with a stripe arrangement and assigned each color to a different twill. Then I rotated the different twills through the stripe sequence, added a couple of mirror repeats to get two curves, and put it on a point threading. Now the shaded twills, each of which could be woven on six shafts, takes 40 shafts to realize the whole design. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I too like to push limits. Um, I wanted to make yardage that was completely tablet woven. And um, here you can see me measuring the warp, but I get to warp the cards in that single step. Uh, I threaded a reed, um, wound the warp onto the back beam. You notice though that the cards are in front of the reed. So after winding on and adjusting the tension, I had to push the cards through the reed because I wanted to use um, the beater to beat my cloth. But because the cards were so spaced so far apart, they were all floppy and loose, unlike on my ankle loom where they're nice and tight and tidy. Finally, we're ready to weave. I turn the cards, turn cards, turn more cards, turn some more cards. There were 160 cards to get the 22 inches I needed. And weaving finally happened. It was working. Um, my band weaving technique was creating something with the drape of actual cloth made on a floor loom. And it was really interesting cloth. Here you can see the actual structure of tablet weaving, which a lot of people don't understand. It's one of the most unique weave structures because it incorporates twist and ply into the cloth. As you turn the cards one direction, you get twist in one direction. When you reverse the direction of that turning, the twist reverses as well. And you can also see the weft um, through the cloth here. Now, 
Cabinet weaving is typically a war-faced weave, so you never see the weft. Here you can see the setup a little better. This is one pattern hoopie, 10 inches. That's about how much I could do in two to four hours. Two hours if it all went well, four hours if I had to unweave any of that 10 inches. But a couple months later, the clock was finished, four yards of textured, semi-transparent wonder. By the way, that's my floor loom. <laughs> A couple of years ago, I got very tired of John whining every time he had wove on his floor loom. He really doesn't like it. No. And he's a tablet weaver. And I said, you don't need that. Talked him into selling his floor loom, which was fine until he wanted to weave this. And then he had to come over and use mine. It took me a while to understand that you could be a weaver and not actually have a floor loom. <laughs> but um, as you can see here, I really love this cloth. And of course, it needed a band um, to accompany it for the hanging because everything needs a band. And actually, if the cloth were collapsed and woven, truly warp faced like a band, this is what it would look like. Here you can see there's tons of movement, crazy, crazy movement in this. Um, I submitted it to the yardage exhibit at Convergence in Reno last year, and I was floored that it won the Complex uh, Weaver's Award there. And I honestly was just happy to have it shown, but thank you. <laughs> Amy and I also both love the complexity that is possible with weaving. One of my current passions is designing multi-shaft lift plans in Photoshop Elements. Here I took a curvy overall pattern that I found somewhere on the internet, isolated one repeat in Photoshop Elements, and then filled the design with four shaft broken twill presets. I put the design on a straight draw as part of a warp that I used to get to know the new to me 40 shaft loom. I ended up doing a lot of other things on this straight draw threading, including words, which are very fun, flowers, and leaves, even the St. Louis Arch. This was inspired by a group study, a study group challenge to weave something inspired by architecture. I selected the iconic St. Louis Arch in part because of its graceful curve, which I thought would be a challenge to replicate on the rectilinear grid of warp and weft. After selecting a picture that I liked, I drew it in Photoshop Elements and replaced each of the colored areas with a different weave structure. I wanted the reflected arch to be visibly blurrier than the actual arch itself, so I picked plain weave and 312 for the arch, and broken 312 and broken 2212 for the reflection. After converting the lift plan to converting to a lift plan in Fiberworks, I realized that my arch was a little too short and squat, and I went back to Photoshop Elements and resized it to stretch it out a little bit. That gave me a lift plan for a weaving draft on a 16 shaft point threading. And there you have it, the St. Louis Arch. That's really cool. So you chose local. I decided to go further afield. <laughs> so this project started with a fact I heard about the distance from the Earth to the, to the sun, which is 93 million miles. But what was really interesting about that fact is that that distance is perfect for life on this planet. If we were any closer to the sun, it would be too hot and we'd burn up. If we were any further from that, it would be too cold and we'd all freeze. So that was actually a little humbling. So I decided to rep represent that idea in a band. But I needed a band that went from yellow to blue to go from that sky kind of space I knew you could change colors using weft, clasp weft in weaving, and I thought that should work in a warp. You could do a clasp warp. So I tried that. Tablet weaving, as we now know, incorporates twist into the cloth, but it also creates an opposite waist twist that we have to deal with. And I chose to do that by weighting the entire warp. So each card, the four threads from each card, were wrapped around a bobbin and weighted off the back of the loom. These two decisions cost me a great deal of time. <laughs> it took me two years to warp this project. 
Now that wasn't two years of time, that was two years of, now I'm really frustrated, I'm going to do something that I enjoy for a little while. <laughs> it also took an exhibit deadline to actually force me to get it done. But I wanted an Earth and Sun represented and I wanted them to be different color from the band. Well, the only way in tablet weaving to do that is brocade. So we had some brocade on it. I wanted lettering on the band, um, so I decided to use a double face technique. After a lot of sampling, a lot of pattern making, and a lot of warping, I started weaving. And here you can actually see where the, the clasp warp switches from yellow to blue. So all of these different combined te techniques actually gave me the exact feel I wanted for that piece. And it did win first place in, house, in the housewares category at the members exhibit last year in, in Indianapolis. Even after seeing that band, I have to tell you, John and I did not start in the same place when it came to color. Obviously. Um, my work was flat when we met, remember? <laughs> but we are really good at challenging one another, and honestly, my challenge was color. I started with a much wider passion for color, having done much of my formative knitting during the 1980s. Remember the Kay Fawcett era where more color was always better? I would do 40 to 80 different yarns in a sweater. Those were the days. <laughs> and then I met John, who gravitated to drab earth tones. <laughs> well, since my palette was so limited, I will well with what I liked. And I'm sorry, but beige, white, and black can be quite striking. <laughs> Especially if you throw in a little daring forest green. <laughs> But I was trying to expand and put some of those new color ideas to work. John wove those placemats, truly. I was as shocked as you are, but I have to admit he got them out of his house as fast as he could, and they're at my house now. <laughs> and Amy has been instrumental in reminding me on multiple occasions that there is always someone out there that will like those colors, even pink. <laughs> it's a lesson I've learned from weaving hundreds of towels in every color of the rainbow. They all sell, even the ones that have the colors that I think are very strange. But I also get that sometimes less color is more. Remember how I said I'm a workshop junkie? I'll sometimes talk our guild into hosting a workshop that I've already taken somewhere else, and yes, I take it a second time. I, for example, I went to Southeast Fiber Forum in 2013 and took Diane Totten's crimp cloth workshop and had such a great time that I talked our guild into hosting her the next year for the same workshop in St. Louis. And then after the workshop, we started a study group to play with woven shibori and dyeing. Of course I invited John to join, but he tried to beg off telling me it was impossible to do woven shibori dyeing on bands. You can. <laughs> Are you sure? Prove it. <sighs> but that's one of the things we do for each other. Challenge the other to move outside their comfort zones. And I was intrigued, so I spent hours <laughs> and wove bands with ties in lengthwise, woven in. I knotted them all up. <laughs> I gave them to Amy and put them in the dye pot. I don't die. I will never die again. <laughs> And this is what I got, which was interesting, but not overwhelming. And quite honestly, I think that if, if you did some resist ties and dyeing, it would probably be a lot easier and work better. But if you hadn't challenged me, I never would have realized that there would have been an easier way to do this. I also talked John into contributing something for our guild exhibit at Midwest in Houghton Hancock, Michigan. The theme was Northern Lights, and we decided to do something with woven iridescence to illustrate it. Again, John categorically denied that it was possible in tablet weaving. And I tried everything. I tried thick and thin yarns, I tried complementary colors, I tried finer pattern work, but this little voice, Bobby Irwin voice kept saying in my head, the, in, the, what causes iridescence is the interaction between warp and weft. These are warp face bands, there is no weft. So I opened up the weaving use, using a reed, and this was actually the precursor to the yardage that came later. And it works, kind of. I mean, Bobby may argue that this is not true iridescence, but it does change color based on the angle of viewing. 
And here it looks huge. But I dare you to find it in this uh, exhibit with all these other beautiful pieces. <laughs> After my first Midwest conference where they, the gang adopted me, I never felt alone at a conference, and my first convergence was in Tampa in 2008. Another bag. Yay. <laughs> and if you've ever gone to convergence, you might know Lillian Whipple, who weaves with those really fine threads and makes these little small patches with the theme of the conference. This is a competition I'm always going to win. I've been to way more conferences than him. <laughs> Daryl Lancaster was the keynote there, and it was my second ever fashion show. And she had this beautiful piece in the Tampa colorway in the fashion show um, exhibit. And in Sheboygan, they had to drag me to that fashion show. And now I'm grabbing them all, going, let's go, hurry up, fashion show's about to start. Um, after that fashion show, I swore I would have a piece walk the Convergence fashion show stage. Um, the only problem was, how does a band weaver make a fashion piece? He gets his friends involved. <laughs> and so, when the fashion show requirements came out for Long Beach in 2012, well, they had a category for collaborative fashions. I was like, this is perfect. Actually, what started this was my saying in passing, wow, that band would look really nice on a garment. Next thing I know, I'm volunteering to weave yardage. We chose Bamboo 7 from Silk City Fibers and an 8 shaft twill for drape, which I expanded to 16 shafts because that's what I do. <laughs> The original band wasn't long enough, so I wove another one in the same bamboo yarn. And I wove the yardage. And Carolyn agreed to sew it all together for us. We decided as a group that a kimono would be a good choice. Carolyn and I really wanted some, it to be something that John might actually wear, or at least model, and a kimono is unisex. Plus, it had to be something long enough to show off his gorgeous band. So this is the photo of the panel we submitted to the HGA um, jury, and it was accepted. Yay! <laughs> Unfortunately, Carolyn and I couldn't make it to that convergence, so John was on his own. Which felt really strange and awkward, much like how I look here. <laughs> um, so uh, this was awkward because we weren't supposed to be taking photos in there, and so we were like trying to surreptitiously, you know. <laughs> Um, but I went to the fashion show by myself, and um, at, uh, were many of you at the Long Beach? Okay, good. So you may remember this. So they did not use professional models. They used students from a local college from their theater department. And um, I mean, the kimono is a unisex outfit. But several pieces, you know, we're about halfway through the show, lots of golf clapping and things. And I'm dreading the moment that the kimono is going to come out and get no or little reaction. And from around the um, curtain struts, the most beautiful Italian man I've ever seen. <laughs> Slick back black hair, tight black jeans, no shirt. <laughs> kimono is flying. I'm going, look at that drape, look at that flow. <laughs> The crowd goes wild. And I was, that's my kimono. Our kimono. Yeah, yeah. Our, our kimono. We, we collaborate on a less formal level all the time. If the two of us are together, we're talking fiber, you can bet on it. And that always leads to bouncing ideas off each other. Her partner, Mary Jo, likens us to a ping pong game as ideas fly from one side of the table to another. In fact, I would say our biggest strength in our friendship is our constant interaction, bouncing ideas off each other all the time, continuing to challenge each other and grow in our respective expressions of weaving, which are quite different. But in spite of our differences in the type of weaving we do, and even our approach to problem solving, we complement each other and make each other better weavers. By challenging each other. Encouraging each other. Celebrating both our differences. And our commonalities. This is our hope and our wish for you too. 
to embrace our differences, but also to come together and encourage, challenge, and support each other. So who are your fiber friends? 